Hey, praise the Lord. <laughs> it's been interesting, to say the least. I uh, have been working on this room quite a bit at different times and been challenged by... I have uh, lots of health issues that come up at different times that give me good days and bad days. And often when you're in ministry you don't have the opportunity to just let your hair down so to speak because if you did they would reveal the simplistic faith that you have that is totally dependent upon the Spirit of God to give you health or opportunities to be used by him in a way that most people don't today really understand you know I mean I can I can say something to you like well if I don't teach, if I don't preach, if I don't share the Word of God, my health goes down. And they'll think, well, God doesn't work that way. And I'll say, well, you're right, sort of. It's like, in the scriptures we know that when I tried to remain silent, Jeremiah spoke, it, you know, it was like his words burned within my soul. And we are told that it was like a fire when David tried to remain silent. And, and Job, when he tried not to speak. I mean, there, there's a certain amount of truth to, you know, God doesn't take away your health, but there's a certain amount of reality to the Word of God in you that causes you to live and move and have your being. In Him we live, in Him we move, in Him we have our being. There's more to life and the reality of the spiritual dimension in your life than you might know of. And that's why I like to call this video perspective, or if I put this in perspective, in perspective. Because a lot of times people don't have the miraculous happening in their life. They have a practical faith. They have a practical reality. They don't deal in the world with the spiritual dimension overlaid on it. They don't see God moving in their life daily. They don't hear God speaking to them hourly. They don't know that God intervenes with them continually. They're not aware of the things of the Spirit as... God moves and has his being in your life. Jesus knew that and that's why in the book of Revelation it's very interesting one of the letters to the seven churches Jesus mentions this and he says behold which really means look consider see in the Hebrew we say ra'a it means to take in and to grasp with the understanding of your mind to appreciate with the feeling of your soul to have within your physical being the reality of the spiritual dimension causing you to know things beyond your ability to recognize except that it be God showing them. And that's really where behold comes from. Now, I know there are people that like Greek words, you know, and they go into you know the Greek, you know, which is just word, you know, it's a hermeneutic. It's a word study, you know, and a lot of Greek and a lot of Gentile ways of looking at things, or Western ways, if you want to call it that. To me, Western means Gentile. It's just, there's so much difference. I mean, it's hard to explain the difference between the East and the West because really there's a huge difference. Like in Hebrew, everything is done in expressions, you know, like when we say hate or when we say that, you know, the sin that missing the mark. It means more than just missing the mark. It means as to take aim with your life and to point it in a certain direction. And that you have chosen that direction and that's what you want to hit. You want to hit that mark and you miss the mark. It means so much more in flowery speech that the Eastern cultures are used to using than the simple word in the West that is down to one word, explanation of one word, you know, like, Yes, no, whatever. But a lot of times I I appreciate the simplicity of teaching the Word of God, but I also appreciate the integrity of the depthual reality that God is, that God always will have more for those who de delve into the depths and want to learn so much more than what there is on the surface. And a lot of times that's what frustrates me in some ways because people will say to me all kinds of things that, I listen to their words and I listen to the way that they use their words and I watch and see how they apply their words to their life. 
you know, people will say, like I just said, behold, you know, and Jesus said that, um, you know, in the book of Revelation, to behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man open the door, if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him, sup with him. Well, you know, I mean, most Gentile Christians or most Christians will come up to you and say, well, you know, that's superficial, super, you know, we we, we got to spiritualize this. We have to make it not a reality. We have to make it into something that isn't what the Word says. Because, you know, we're literalists, but that's not literal there. That's figurative. Well, okay. Really? So, when do I know when it's figurative? When do I know that it's literal? Well, the bluntness of it is, is that it is literal all the time. And it is figurative all the time. And it is spiritual all the time. And it is a dimensional reality that the Word of God is alive and living and is performing that with which it was meant to send forth, that which God has accomplished and is going to reveal to us as is accomplished because He's already written it down, it's already been accomplished, and it's already been done. Jesus said it's finished. So in some ways, these debates that go on in the Western cultural mindset really kind of like interest me very little because in the East, they've already figured it that, that part out and missed the mark anyways which goes to show you that east or west, you, somehow you just don't get it all. But my point is this. With words, if I was told that God was knocking at the door and I heard a knock, I'd go answer the door. Now, I wouldn't go opening my heart and looking inside and going, uh, my vowels opening up, you know, you know. And one of the things that I learned early on in my Christian walk was that Christians say the darndest things. Now, I don't mean two-year-olds. I don't mean three-year-olds or children. You know, there was a show out on television by Art Linkletter, and then later on became another version of it with a, a Western guy that was a Christian. Now, I can't remember. He's a comedian. And it was, called, it was called Children Say the Darndest Things. And it was a wonderful show. You know, I think it was around in the 50s, if I recall right. But it's interesting to me that Christians including pastors, including teachers, say the darndest things. Now, words, recently I heard a Christian worship song that says, words can build you up, words can break you down, words can do it, da, da, da. you know, and I was like, I listened to the lyrics, you know, and I went, yeah, it's good, you know, it's like, yeah, okay, I get it, you know. And for this generation, it's a good thing, you know, this song, and it's a great song, you know. But, you know, I'm kind of a boring Christian. I like the Word of God. I really do. I, I, I thoroughly enjoy getting into the Word, studying it, reading it, meditating on it, considering it, pondering it, thinking about it all day. When I rise up, when I sit down, when I go as forth, when I'm on my way, when I'm in the work, when I'm on my day, when I'm doing, you know, whatever I'm doing. Everything I'm doing, I seem to always be doing in the Word of God. And so, I always thought that the Word of God was Jesus because Jesus said in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. And I thought, well, okay, so Jesus is the Word of God, you know, and I said, I can do that because I have a sci-fi background, you know, and my mind is like, you know, works differently, you know, it doesn't, maybe there's a screw loose, maybe I have ADD. It's funny how excuses come on every 20 or 30 years and people jump on the bandwagon for it. Oh, well, you know, I got the ADD, you know, I can't be right, you know. <laughs> I got the Spirit of God. I am right. I'm sorry. <laughs> Oops. But my point, quite simply, is words. Perspective, words. Word of God, perspective. Your eyes look at things and see things differently than mine. Because I need glasses. So, obviously, I need something to help me in my perspective to look at life in general, to understand what life is all about. So, I pick up a Bible in order to understand that there's more to life than sucking my thumb. There's more to life than having my diapers changed. There's more to life than just simply going through the motions of this idea that, well, you know, if you don't work, you don't eat. Penny saved is penny earned, you know. A man of integrity walks according to his word, you know. 
Um, we need to be politically active. We need to, and you know, the list goes on. I mean, you know, everybody's got their societal ideologies, their humanistic endeavors, their terminologies that they use in order to communicate to one another, and they say, "Well, you know, you you, you can't, you know, what do you what do you what are you saying here, Michael? You, you, are you trying to say that you know if you don't work, you don't, you could get by without working?" And you know, I kind of go, well, "I don't, you know." Do you really want to know? And some people ask me, you know, and I say, well, yeah. I say, well, what did Jesus say? Because, you see, in my life, I call myself a Christian because I look at Jesus and I say, that's something different about that guy. Now, I don't see anybody else doing what he did today. It's like I hear Christians tell me, well, you know, you, you could kill your enemies because, you know, God wants you to join the military, you know, fly salute and everything else and be patriotic and go out and shoot your enemy. I go, really? Wow. Where's that? Well, it's the God and the same, you know, same God. You know, I mean, God killed the Midianites, you know, God killed the Canaanites, God killed the... Really? You want to look a little closer? You want to study this together? Come over to my house. Come on to my house, my house of my house. I give you the word of God. Woo! But no, Jesus, being that he came on the scene, said something interesting on the Sermon on the Mount. He came and said, I say unto you. Now, I don't disagree with you telling me that, you know, it's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and the Word of God is the same yesterday, today, and the law is still there, and, you know, all of it's still there. But I have a way of explaining it a little better, maybe, than you might understand. You see, I kind of got a handle on it, maybe because I study it day and night, and I ask God the tough questions. God, I don't get it. What's up? Dude, I'm not getting it. It's not clicking. I need somebody, I need someone to tell me the truth. Jesus, you said you are the way, the truth, and the life. I want to know the truth, the way, the life. So Jesus says, well, you know, it's in my book. Have you read it? And I read it cover to cover, you know, and so I study it and I look at the words, you know, and I look at the expressions and I look at, you know, kind of the things and I go, and I listen to what people tell me about it, you know, and I go, hmm, uh-uh. And I taught my wife the same thing. You know, I said, honey, I said, you know, I don't want you to be taught by me. First of all, you wouldn't like being me. I would rather that God taught you and that you learned through your personal relationship with Jesus so that you and him have intercourse. No, not that kind of intercourse. Intercourse, you know, the kind that says conversation. Conversation, not like talking, text, you know, text is not talking. But having a communication where God speaks to you and you speak to God. You know, kind of like what we're doing here, sort of. Except this is a little one-sided because I'm not really hearing what you have to say. And quite frankly, sometimes I don't want to. I like what God has to say. I like what God tells me about what people are doing. Because he does in Proverbs. I mean, Proverbs, if you read it and apply it to people's lives, you kind of go, do you know out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks and you're telling me what kind of person you are by your mouth, fool? Dude, what are you saying to me? I have ears and I remember. And I guess that's part of my problem is that when I look at the Word of God, you know, God causes me to remember by His Spirit because I've asked Him to help me because I said, you know, I've got questions with God and in my perspective, I don't like the answers that people give me. I don't like the answers sometimes that pastors give me. I don't like the answers that sometimes teachers give me. I go, okay, God, you know, I get it. You know, I, I, I got the picture here, you know, it's like, okay, you created the sun to rise and to rain to fall on the wicked and the good. Now, Jewish thought, Oi! They! Been around for a while. But before there were Jews, what were they? You know, I mean, Abraham is kind of like, you know, father of faith, but what's the going on the before the Abraham? -a? Oh, Melchizedek! Ah! So, when Abraham met, you know, Melchizedek, it was like, why did he do the communion thing? You got the bread, I got the wine. We do it together, we got the time. Woohoo! Oh, 
you mean there were followers from sons of Adam that kept their faith in the one true God and God worked with these people. I mean, isn't that what it says in Genesis? All the way? See, Genesis, how far does it go before we get to Abraham? Where did those people come from? You see, i got all these questions. And I ask God those questions, and I deal with it, you know, and God says, read my word, you know, and I go, okay, I'm reading it, and now i got better informed way of asking God questions. But you see, I like to think about it. So, when I think about it, I'm doing what Jesus said about that behold, to consider, to think about, to ponder, to reality check, you know, and say, you know, if I'm not comfortable with the answer, I'm not going with it, you know, and God knows with me, I'm not going to, you know, you could do what you want to do, but we're talking eternal life here. And I'm kind of like a little nervous about some of these things sometimes when people tell me, you know, oh, yeah, no problem, you know, just grace, grace, and more grace, you know, and I'm like, well, yeah, I'm saved by grace, but, um, I don't got to do nothing? You know, just be loved? Yeah, really. I mean, it's true that God loves you, and God, you know, has a plan for you, and God's working with you, and God, you know. But you know, you might be a little more there. Just a little bit. A little bit. You know, trampling again, you know, the blood of Jesus Christ. I mean, it's funny because, you know, you listen to pastors sometimes, you know, and they'll tell you one thing, you know, and they'll tell you, oh, get saved, get saved, and all of a sudden after you get saved, it's like, Kaboom! Where did the rest of the story come from? How come we suddenly got these rules and regs and, oh, we don't have rules and regs. You don't? Then how come we're going through all these rules and regs and applications and process and, oh, by the way, you know, you got to check this guy out, check that guy out, check him out, and, you know, make sure that they got that in order and that in order and that. Or, after all, they're moving into leadership now. Wow. Interesting. Now, you see, I've been a Jesus freak a long time. I'm kind of silly about it. I like to find people that follow Jesus, they want to know Jesus, and I bless them with what they're doing. God bless you. Go. Enjoy God. Enjoy peace. Be with the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Give Him your life. Dedicate yourself to Him. Follow Him all the days of your life. No, you won't, but try to anyways, because guess what? You're going to fall flat on your face, you know, and sooner or later you're going to learn about that too, you know, and you're going to kind of go through, you know, struggles and trials and tribulations. But having a personal relationship, knowing that your Father in Heaven loves you, knowing that the Spirit of God in you is working both to do it to will of His good pleasure, knowing that Jesus is working on your behalf in Heaven to have you learn from the Spirit of God, the things of God, kind of makes it easier to deal with life in general. So I kind of look at this whole idea about words, you know, and that behold thing, you know, and I look and I see, you know, I consider and I sit down and I say, I don't know it all, but I want to. I don't get it all, but I ask. I don't really appreciate it all as much as I should, but I still go to God daily and ask. And, you know, here in Utah, I've been kind of like dealing with this whole kind of like bad attitude, good attitude, reverse attitudes, and then just directions and objections and perspectives. And <whistles> Boy, do people got a lot of perspectives here. You'd think that they lived, you know, underneath, you know, tyranny of Nazism or something, you know. Boy, they. If a Jew could get it wrong, can't the Christians? You know, And I think that's sometimes what happens, is that people get off track easily by not realizing what track they're on. You see, life operates on multi-dimensions. There's more than one dimension happening here. I don't know if you've realized this, but you're not a one-dimensional creature. You don't live on a flat piece of paper. This piece of paper, literally, if I just held it up in front of the camera, would be one dimension. You're not that way. Oh, that's that check guy said. Wow, wish I'd have cashed it. <laughs> that's another story. <laughs> Should I get on a sideline and tell you about why we don't take money? Because we get sent money. Sorry, freely receive, freely give. Jesus said it, I do it. Nobody else does, but I do. Watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. Woo! Um, 
Well, not nobody, but you know, there's very few that you know will turn down money once they get it. You know, it's like, oh yeah, well, let's go for it. Um, but my point is this: when you realize you're not one-dimensional, you begin to look at things and go, well, what's a dimension? Well, a dimension is kind of like what you're made up of. You're three-dimensional because you have height, depth, and width. Three, see? Height, depth, width, you know. And that's why we have 3D glasses, you know, we go to movies because we want to see things in three dimensions. We want to see them come at us or them have depth. Because we can't see in two-dimensional just height and depth or height and width. That's just kind of like doesn't work so well. You know, one dimension would be like a line, you know. So, three dimensions, we understand that. We just go, oh, okay, you know, we're, we're, we're fine with that. You know, now that you explain it, you know, I, I look at a computer screen and I see maybe, you know, one dimension or two dimensions, you know. And maybe when I text, you know, I'm kind of one-dimensional, you know. So, I understand it's three dimensions, you know. It's like, okay, we got it. Well, if there's three, there's more, isn't there? <gasps> really? Yeah. You see, your emotions come from somewhere, and so does your spirit. And they operate in ways that, if I said to you, describe for me physically what the emotion love is, you'd go, well, it's warm feeling. Well, where do you feel it? Is it out here? Or is it in here? Or is it up here? Where is it exactly? And you'd begin to tell me, you know, your experiences. You know, I'm like, well, you know, when I think about that person, you know, I just feel all oh, warm fuzzies and little butterflies. Woo! Really? Hmm. So where did it come from? Well, I, I don't know. I guess it came from my brain. Really? You think so? Hmm. Interesting. Huh. Okay. If I asked you, where does, how does your love change? How do you change from loving one minute to not loving the next minute? You know, like, oh, I love that person, and oh, they hurt my feelings, so I don't love that person anymore. Interesting. What 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 changed? Was it a chemical imbalance in the brain? It kind of went. Woo you know, we can put some electrodes there and stimulate that love. Love, 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 love. Can we provoke ourselves into love? I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. Can we program ourselves? You know, what made us not love? And if it did make us not love, how do we stop that from not loving to loving? How do you change these things with words if it's just words on a piece of paper and we're just speaking words and they don't have more content or portent to them than we realize? Well, I don't know. Those are the questions I ask God. See, I find them in the answer. I find the answers in the Word of God, but we won't go there because it's kind of like a long study. Oh, this has been a long study. Really? Not for me. This is just a perspective. I'm just kind of looking at things. Since we know that emotions, obviously, there's more to them than just simply stimulus, where we go, oh, look at that person, I'm in love for the first time. I saw them and I love them. Now I don't see them, so I don't love them? Really? Are you sure? So, spiritually, there's things of the spirit that we don't know about. Now, you were born, and I'm sorry to say this, but I, I, got, I got to tell you, the moment you were born, you were a bloody mess. Well, yeah, you were. You were. That's that's what you were. You know. I mean, you were born in blood and water. You know, <laughs> that's what you were. You know, and it's kind of like ugh, gross. You know. Not only that, you were kind of still attached, so I had to detach you. You know, from your mama, <laughs> slap you on the butt. You know, and get you talking, breathing. <gasps> wow. Okay, I'm breathing. I slap back. <laughs> That doctor didn't know what was coming when he got me. He grabbed me by the nose, you know, held me up and said, what's this thing? You know, said, yeah, I know. <laughs> Anyways, but my point being simply that if you didn't know what was going on when you were born, what makes you think that you know what's going on when you're spiritually born? Hello? In other words, you don't know the things of the Spirit 
neither can you understand them except that someone or something or a person tell you about it. You see, you're not going to remember coming out of your mother's womb. You can tell me you did and you can say that you had a prenatal memory experience and I'm going to go, yeah, right, what demon was whispering in your ear, buddy? <laughs> or was it your mama? <laughs> you know, my mother, it was interesting, you know, funny story is that I, I, I for a while I used to think that I, I just really couldn't believe quite what I was reading because it was just fascinating to me. It was like it opened my eyes to a whole different world. And this was before I was saved. But my mother, um, when I was born, wrote letters in the first person as though she were me and I was seeing her. And so she wrote them as though I was seeing my mother for the first time. Beautiful, powerful letters. I mean, they were like really interesting. I mean, it, it kind of, I think it may have inspired me to be a writer. You know, because it provoked my imagination. But boy, for the longest time, it used to really make me wonder, did I remember that? You know, it's like, wow, you know, it's kind of cool. You know, but it was, it was interesting. Now, the reality is, no, I don't remember anything like that. I can remember pretty far back, you know, some individual experiences that were, you know, pre five, about under five, you know, and they were interesting experiences. But other than that, no, you know, we don't have much memory, although they say we can provoke it because our memory is a recording device, you know, with which it's stored in some way. Um, but the connection of how to retrieve it or how to use it or how to properly process it isn't there. That required education. You know, your body required your mind to catch up with what it was inputting. It had all kinds of things coming into the eye and you, oh, 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 oh what's love? You know, somebody hugged you and you went, oh, that's love. You know, so in a physical realm, in the physical plane, in the physical dimension, you didn't know what was going on. You were a bloody mess. You started off with not knowing much of what was going to happen or what was occurring in life. The same thing is true in this spiritual dimension. When you became born again, you haven't a clue what's really going on. You only have an idea based upon what people told you. And I only have an idea what it's like to be born by what people tell me or what I see. Now, Jesus, whoa, he's there at the beginning. Really? Whoa, that's cool. He's the Son of God. Wow, that's kind of neat. And the Son of Man. Whoa, Son of Man. So you mean he's like me? Yeah, you know, basically, you know, he's kind of like, you know, he decided to, you know, chuck it for a while and, you know, pluck it down here on earth, you know, and kind of like operate like a bunch of us chickens, you know, walking around clucking, you know. And, and then one day, God said, it's time. And so Jesus went, okay, I need to be filled again with that same spirit with which I am God, I am the Son of God, I am one with my Father and one with the Spirit. And so when he was filled again with the overflowing of the Spirit, he demonstrated to us something that would be for us, being born again and then being filled with the Spirit. He demonstrated that we have a spiritual reality operating in our life. We have something of the nature of God that needs to be applied to the reality of life in the physical world we live in Otherwise, we're missing out on the majority of what's happening in this life all around us. Took that long to get to this point, didn't it? Wow, man, that guy went long story. That process of suddenly discovering there's more to this dimension means your eyes get open to seeing, oh wow, look at that, there's angels just walked in the door. Oh, you don't think it can happen? Why? Think about that for a minute. Why don't you think that? Because we're going to talk about that, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Why don't you think Jesus will walk in that door? He did it for his disciples. Did he say that you won't see me again until you know I come again, you know, into glory? And he did say that, you know, that you won't, you know, I won't eat of this bread or drink of this wine until we do it in the kingdom. Although I think they did it, you know, afterwards in the kingdom, but that's a long story. But my point is this. A lot of people don't want to literalize or take 
literally the Word of God because they have no comprehension of the things of the Spirit. Because things of the spiritual dimension can only be seen by way of knowledge, incorporation, education, infilling, indwelling, opening the eyes of, opening the ears of, and causing the reality of a spiritual birth to be so overwhelming in you that you could begin to see the kingdom of heaven about you. You could begin to know things that there's no way you could know. Words of knowledge, words of wisdom. You begin to comprehend the things and discernments of spirits. Literally. You could walk along and touch things and know that there's a difference between what someone has just vacated a room and you feel that presence is somehow still there. You know, kind of like... <clears throat> what these stupid shows try to do on Ghostbusters. You know, I mean, they do these Ghostbuster shows or these ghost investigators and they, they try to go in and use some kind of gimmicky, you know, scientific process to prove an idea they have. Now, science is good in one way. Science has demonstrated that we have an aura about our body. Some people say that that aura is just simply the electrical magnetic pulse that comes off of the vibration of the atoms that are moving at such a fast rate that our mind can't comprehend, you know, looking at a mass of movement, so we see solidity and we see by way of the the distance between the atoms as though perceived as being physically some way solid, when in reality we're porous, baby. <laughs> you look at this with different eyes, you know, you take a telescope and you go, Oh, baby, man, I can see right through that. Woohoo! Yeah, we're porous. We could have passed through different things because we operate at a certain vibration. We operate at a certain, me a certain medium of electrical, magnetic <laughs> compounds that are so structured together that in one way they don't make any sense of why they hold together but in other ways they stay together and they form up what I look at and I see as my physical body and I say oh finger oh you know fingernail ooh my body tells me that's a fingernail because somewhere along the line I was educated to see this porous part that looks a little lighter than the other part that looks a little darker as being something solid and that it grows you know and it has a certain amount of you know uh, characteristics that I my mind was taught when I was a child to call that a fingernail. Now God may call it something else, but yeah, my mind it says fingernail because I was educated that way. Spiritually, the same thing is true. There are things of the spirit that obviously aren't what we think they are. We look at the Word of God and we say, oh, you know, John went to you know the heavens, you know, and says, hey, you know, there's there's a scroll. Well, I can't be a scroll, really. You don't think so, huh? Huh. Wonder why. Is that because you've been educated to think in the physical dimension and not the spiritual? So the heavenlies, the heavens, have a certain reality that we've been told by an eyewitness. We've been told by Jesus a lot, but we've been told by an eyewitness, John, having gone there. And Paul said that there were things that, you know, just, whoo, you know, so unbelievable, we wouldn't believe it. People have told me that they experience heaven at different times. And, you know, it's interesting. I, I would agree with them if I had something to agree with them with. You know, if they could say something that I could find in Scripture to agree with them with. But if it isn't in the Word of God, I'm not going to agree with them. I'll say, well, they had an experience. I don't know what that experience is, but it's not the same as my experience. In my experience, I know what I've seen, what I've heard, and what I've handled in my own hands. That I do know. Other than that, I don't know. You know, people on acid trips have experiences in heaven. People on... You know, whatever trips, you know, have all kinds of experiences that they tell, they say. Joseph Smith says he had an experience. Now, I don't know. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. <laughs> I'm not going to go there. But my point is this. Jesus came from there. Jesus as a son of God, or as the son of God, the only begotten of the Father, came to show us and to reveal to us the truth and the reality of a spiritual dimension we have no understanding of. We have no comprehension. And daily, I look at the perspective of watching that sunrise as it's coming up in the back window behind me, and I realize there's more to my life than the physical dimension of going to work, getting a car, 
looking at man-made objects and dealing with this man-made realities that men keep trying to propagate upon the world and tell us that this is what societal is and these are right actions, attitudes, and directions for our life when they're contrary to the Word of God. Oh, does God know what he's talking about? Does God speak from a perspective of knowing you and knowing me? See, at some point in time, you get to where you have to define God, your God, for yourself. I could do that for you. I could say, well, he's the triune God or the triunity or the tripartite or however you want to put it into the, you know, I could call it the echad, you know, the echad uh, Elohim, Elohim ve Elohad, you know, the, the, the God of gods, the king of the universe, the master of, you know, <laughs> it's not the master, it's the master, master of, well, the master. You know, it's probably the only way to leave it in Hebrew would be the best way to say it, is the master. But the, the, the bottom line is this. That's my definition. Who he is, how he is, what he operates, and how he deals with you may be different. You see, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob was said that way because with Abraham, God dealt with him in a certain way. And if you look at Isaac, God dealt with Isaac a different way. And if you look at Jacob, God dealt with him a different way. Now, God kept the promise that he made to Abraham through Isaac and Jacob, and that's why he was called the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But it's also the God that intervened in Abraham's life. Who is your God? Is he the God of Michael? Yeah, he's my God. Yeah, no problem. I didn't do intervenes every day in my life. Is he your God? What is your God? How is he operating in your life? Is he like Abraham? You know, dealing with you, speaking to you. Is it like long distance time before you ever hear from him again? Or is it daily, like Jesus said, that we could commune with God, that we should know him intimately and personally as he prayed, that we could have a reality of the spiritual kingdom being here in our midst. Can we see things like Jesus said, Hey, I saw Satan falling from the heavens once the disciples came back. And he says, Man, it was awesome. I've watched these things. Don't be satisfied in your life with operating in specifically, singularly, and only the physical dimension. If you're looking with your eyes and you're saying, Hey, you know what? Every day I get up, I read my Bible, you know, and that's it. You know, I go to church, I hear the pastor talk, you know, hey, that's good. I do my tithing, you know, I, I throw a little money towards the church, you know, I, I do my good thing, you know. I got news for you. We're getting ready for eternity. We're getting ready to live in a reality of being spiritual beings that we are because we've been born again, not of the flesh, but of the spirit. We're becoming the word of God. We're becoming this book and we should know it intimately. We should know it in reality. It should be alive and living in us and we should be communicating it daily for us to each other in psalms and songs and spiritual songs, making melody in our hearts, which right now, you know, most people are just singing songs, you know, they're spiritual songs, you know. But for me, they're kind of like dead, you know. It's like kind of like the humanist way of saying things, you know, sometimes. Sometimes it's got the Word of God in it and I'm happy about that. Sometimes it's more like, hey, you know, this is my experience, I'm singing about it. Okay, I'm happy for you. You know, it kind of makes me feel like I'm happy with me, you too. You know, and, but at some point in time, you have to have your own song. You have to have your own heart. You have to have your own personal relationship with Jesus. You have to be able to say, "The God of me is my God of me, not me God." <laughs> be careful there. The God of I. You know, it's not my God. It's not thy God. It's you know the God that intervenes in my life who has saved me, who has given himself for me. Now, it just so happens that we have a name that no other name you know, by which a man can be saved except the name of Jesus, that we could use that name, even though we do say that you know Jesus came to introduce us to the Father, to reveal the Father to us, to give us of his spirit, to allow us to know the love, the joy, and the peace that God intended for us, and to have a, an abundant life, which meant a completed life of knowing not abundance in physical things. This world is passing away and the lust thereof. You're going to get tired of the things that you thought you wanted when you were a young man and you get to be an old man and you go, I don't want it no more. I don't want my Harley. I don't want my house. I don't want my car. I don't want my boat. I don't want my ski, jet skis, you know. 
I'm barely bending over to tie my shoes, you know. I don't even want them either, you know. Can I run around naked? <laughs> no? Oh, okay. Well, then put a robe on. But my point is this. In perspective, putting your life into perspective, you need to sit down and examine yourself and say, Hey, I can see this, but is this all there is? Is my hand all there is to life and my physical body, all there is to the meaning of life, is this all that's going to exist for eternity? Forever and ever and ever when I die, what's going to happen? This is going to pass away, obviously, because I could go out and look in the graveyard and see, ooh, ugh, worms, you know, and quite frankly, that's what Jews did, you know, they looked and said, yep, that's where the grave is, you know, and that's what's down there, worms, you know, worms and grave, you know, yep, go to the grave, go to the worms, you know, ugh. And Ecclesiastes talks a lot about that. You know, I looked under the sun and everything was vanity, vanity, you know, until I, you know, kind of considered the spiritual. And that's what happens sometimes when we don't look at our day, today, in the right way, in the right perspective of looking at it as being more than eating, drinking, paying taxes, finding a job, raising our children. That's what the Gentiles do. Do you realize that? Everything the Gentiles said don't be like the Gentiles who love to exercise lordship over one another is what people are doing today. Everything that Christians should be doing is not what we're about, is it? Are we really going out there existing in the reality of the knowledge that this person that we might be living next door to could die without ever hearing the gospel? I'm sure they heard the gospel because the Romans says they have, but my point is this. Do we care? Or should we admit we don't? Because I can say that. Yeah, there's sometimes I don't care. You know, Quite frankly, you know, you can tell me a lot of things about your life and I don't care. There's so many wasted lives out there that say, oh, well, you know, I'm going to be a witness for God at my football game. I'm going to be a witness for God as a great surfer. I'm going to be a witness for God as a great... And they go about their thing, you know, and they do their thing. And then, by the way, they put their stamp, you know, Jesus on it. You know, and it's like, oh, okay, well. Whatsoever the Lord tells you to do, that you should do. If that's what God told you to do, go be it. But, you know, the bottom line is there was one thing Jesus said to do. Go and teach all nations. Go and baptize them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And make disciples of all nations. He said that to his disciples, but he said that to all of them, even to them that believe on his name, even to them that believe on what the disciples were teaching them. There wasn't this kind of like slipshod, you know, Christianity kind of like, you know, let's smooth the butter, you know, and, and make it so that we spread it on the bread, you know, and just feed it to the hungry masses out there and say, hey, you know, you could sit on your duff doing nothing in a pew and get away with it, and guess what? God will take you through. Uh, you, know, you know, you might make it. It's true. Salvation will be accomplished for you. Jesus died that you would be saved. Grace has been given to you that you would be saved. I can tell you this, based upon the letter of seven churches, if you're sitting on your duff doing nothing and you are saved, you're going straight into the Great Tribulation. No doubt about it. You can tell me till the cows come home, God doesn't pour out His wrath upon the church, but uh, <laughs> God does pour His wrath out of the church. That's a false doctrine. It's a false teaching. It doesn't say that. What it says is that God doesn't pour out his wrath upon the individual believers that are following him and that are his disciples. Jesus said, many are called, but few are chosen. And he literally spoke to some of the letters in the seven churches and said, you're going into great tribulation. You're going to do it. This is going to happen. Deal with it. Overcome. Die. Literally is what he said. Jesus said that? Read the letters. Book of Revelation is not a great, you know, twist of trying to interpret something. Jesus said, I'll be with you. I, I, I'll, you know, you, you know me. I died. I've shown the way. I have overcome. But I didn't promise you a rose garden. I didn't promise you you'd be spared of the Great Tribulation. Some of you need it. Literally. In some ways. Because the word of your testimony, loving not your life even unto death, and... Being willing to refuse the mark, of course, and the number of his name and the image of the beast and the number, you know, I mean, you got to be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, basically. You know, you got to refuse it all. You know, just say, no, I'm not going to do that. You know, of course not. Good luck. But God said, I don't really want you to do that. 
I would prefer you overcome by being prepared for the Son. That like the Jewish nation, which was not ready and did not recognize the time of their visitation, I would prefer that you knew when I come. And that's why we have to wake up every day. And we have to take a long, hard look at our lives. We have to sit down and say, what's my perspective on eternity? Am I looking for Jesus to return today? Or am I ignoring the fact that I'm not ready to go home? I want to raise my children. I want my 401k. I want my job. I want my car. I want today to watch you know, my fantasy football team succeed. I want all these things. And I want to do them with Jesus too, but you know, by the way, you know, it's like, well, if I miss the boat, well, you know, I missed the mark. Then guess what? I focused my life. I spent my time doing what I wanted to do. And I brought Jesus with me. Okay. But you know, I don't know where you're at. I only know this. I live in a physical body, this tent that I'm occupying, this Ohalecha. It's a um, kind of like, it's a physical thing, you know, it's like, it's kind of nice, you know, it's like, well, you know, it's like, well, yeah, it's a temple of the Holy Spirit, but, oh, wait a minute, wasn't that what the temple in Jerusalem was? The temple of the Holy Spirit? Now, what was that temple based upon? I think the temple was based upon the Mishkan, the tabernacle. Oh, the tabernacle, what was the tabernacle based upon? The things in heaven. These things that you see, make, and I will describe them to you, and I have put in his heart to, dis, to make them likened unto that which you could see in the book of Revelation. So if you really want to know what the book of Revelation is about, go look at the Mishkan. Go look at the tabernacle traveling to the wilderness. The outer dead badger skins, which is your body, that you should present as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. But it should be dead and crucified. It should be on the outer garment of the covering of the tent to protect from the heat and from the outer weather. So that way the inside is where God abides. You see, the temple, you could make your body into what you wanted to and you could say, well, you know, my body's temple, Holy Spirit, you know, I need to clean it up, I need to fix it up, I need to make it look shiny, you know, I need to look good, you know, dude. You know, I need to be healthy, you know, wealthy and wise, you know, and kind of do that kind of thing like the temple did. And Jesus said not one stone would be left unturned. You think this is mighty? Hey, in three days, I will destroy this temple and raise it up again. Which temple? Ah, you see, you have become the temple of the Holy Spirit. You have become the abiding presence of God to this generation. You have become the light of the world. You have become the Son of God in the midst of a darkened and perverse generation. You have become the witness and the testimony. You have become faithful servant or faithless. The choice is yours. The reality is we need to be sober-minded about the days and the hours and the minutes we spend here on earth. Because we will give an accounting. Now, it's not the kind of accounting that you think. It's more like, well, you know, it's kind of like consumed. But do you really want to and do you expect to be raptured, to be taken away, snatched away, released from the responsibilities that you have in this world to pay your debts, to owe people nothing, to be in love, to have the peace and the love and the joy fulfilling and flowing out of you that you have no fear or no worries of counting to be worried or counting to be worthy, to be spared all these things. Because Paul said, hey, I, I don't feel like I've arrived. Paul said, I pray to be counted worthy, to be spared. He prayed for that. Do we? Or do we have this confident expectation, hey, man, I'm gone in the twinkling of an eye. I'm out of here, dude. Praise the Lord. I hope you do. Because if you're here the day after, I hope you don't lose your faith. Because the reality of what God does is what he chooses. And the Jewish nation knows that very well. Most Jews know, hey, you know what, could you choose someone else for a while? Hey, you know, we, we missed it. But at the same time, the Jewish nation gave birth to the church. There's no doubt about that. It's the Jewish nation that birthed the church. The friends of the bridegroom gave birth to, guess what? The bride. The bride is here. It's been here all along. Cleaning, fixing, doing, being. Quite frankly, Catholic Church looks more a lot of times like the bride than we do sometimes. Because we do a lot of things with our mouth 
we may not do with our heart. A lot of Catholics do a lot of things with their hands that they may not do with their heart. You see, they have a very good demonstration of faith, much like some cults do, much like some false religions do. And the heart, the mind, and the soul must be in unity with the things of the Spirit because God is taking us home. We need to dissolve ourselves and begin to release ourselves from these things that we are so distracted by, that we are so caught up by, that we are so mindful of. Jesus said in those latter days people would eat, drink, marry, and be given a marriage and they would go on as though nothing had changed. And I can tell you this, that after a Sunday, on Monday, no one can remember what Sunday was about. Tell me what the pastor said. I can Tell me what the pastor said by Tuesday or Wednesday. Have you thought about what God has said today? Today, Jesus says to each and every one of us, it's from the Word of God and it's literally, look up today. Today, if you hear His voice, harden not your heart, as it says in the provocation. Why? Because you're meant to be provoked. I'm provoking you on purpose. Today, hear his voice. Today, walk in his will. Today, know him. Today, listen to what he has to say. Today, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in and sup with him. Man, I invite God in every day. What are you doing? Read your Bible. Well, you know, that's a good start. I'm not arguing about that. Read your Bible every day. It's a good thing. I don't read it every day. I read portions, well, I talk about the Bible every day, but, you know, so I don't read it every day, but I do try to read it every day, you know, I try to read parts, you know, but I don't have a dis distinctive Bible reading plan. I'm reading it constantly because I'm living it every day. I'm talking about it, I'm sharing it, I'm wanting to be so mindful of it, I can see the words, you know, like, even in the heavens, when it says, proclaiming the gospel throughout the heavens, you know, the angel is saying, from the heavens to the heavens, you know, going, proclaiming the eternal gospel, from the book of Revelation. That's when the gospel is accomplished, when it goes out into all the world. Not because man did it, we failed. Look at us now. We're nothing compared to what we were. And yet, we have that opportunity to be still salt, light, the witness. We do have to sit down now and take stock of ourselves, though. People are dying all around us. Sometimes our loved ones. People are looking for an answer that isn't a platitude, that isn't wrong, and we have Google now, so we can Google it. I mean, it isn't like the Bible is far from us. There's knowledge here, but is there wisdom? There's integrity of the Scripture within the perspective of how it's been kept throughout the centuries, and that it is accurate to the willful living out of a man's life that all he needs is the Word of God, but does he listen to the Word of God and do it? Jesus said, you've heard it. Why don't you do these sayings of mine? Oh, because they're spiritual. They're not meant to be literal. Hey, if my hand cut, if my hand was really what was offending me, if my hand was causing me to sin, I'd cut that sucker off. I would. I'd tell you right now, go cut off your hand if that's what's offending you. You know, and I know, your hand's not offending you. That's not what the problem is. That's not what's causing you to sin. Right here is between the eyes. That's causing you to sin. Yeah, your brain. You're choosing to sin because you want to, not because your hand did it. But that's what Jesus was trying to say. Look, hey, if it really was your hand, cut it off. Whatever it is, cut it off. It don't matter. Cut off your head. Better to die in righteousness than to die in sin. Quite frankly, I'm not telling you to go out and kill yourself either. Whatsoever the Lord tells you to do, that's what you should do. But did he mean it? Oh, yeah. He meant it. He was dead serious about what the integrity is. Because, you see, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they knew they were going to die. Whether we live or whether we die, we're not going to bow down. I'm sorry. you know. Better for us to die now, hey, you know, cost, tossed into the fire, than to spend eternity forever burning. Didn't happen, did it? So, you see, today, we have a perspective to look at. Are you in the faith? Or are you of the faith? Or were you of the reality of just operating in the physical world and you have no interest in the things of the Spirit? Because that worries me. That 
concerns me. Because in the parable of the ten virgins, there's a real serious aspect there of the Holy Spirit and the application thereof to wonderful Christians. All ten virgins were looking for the Lord's return. All ten virgins slumbered and went to sleep. All ten virgins had oil, meaning that they had peace, they had love, they had joy. I just recently watched a testimonial, basically, of the life and the integrity of a man of God who I met. And I, you know, sat at his feet for a few years. And I've always promoted him and shared his teachings and ministry with Chuck Smith. You know, he was a he was a character. He, was, he always felt like Whenever you looked at Chuck, you always felt like he just walked out from the presence of God. It just, I mean, when he's teaching in the pulpit. I'm not going to say that everybody in the pulpit is the same when they come out. They're not. They're definitely not. There's a difference. The Holy Spirit fills at that moment. Way over the top. Just like right now I'm dealing with a pastor. It's like, you know, man, I love the guy. You know, the guy is wonderful in the pulpit. Sometimes, you know, he's a little off, but, you know, most of the time, 90% of the time, hey, wonderful in the pulpit. Comes off some really good messages. And then I watch him say things, you know, and I go, well, that's not true. Well, that's wrong. No, nope, that, well, you know, made a mistake there. And he's young. He's just shooting off his mouth, telling the same story sometimes, 10, 15 times, you know. It's like, well, okay. You know, I, there might be one new person here today. You know, I look around, and, yeah, that's a new person. Okay, so he's telling another new story. Somebody new just found out, well, all you want to know about the pastor, you know. I don't want to know. I want to know about Jesus, you know. And he's learning, you know, he's growing, he's getting there. He's, as I complain to God or pray for him or pray to God blesses his family and his wife and his children and the ministry he's in and the ministry he's got and the ministry and making him into the ministry he's going to become. Because he hasn't really found himself yet. He hasn't got his own identity. He's got the identity of what people want from him or expect from him. And every pastor goes through that in their first ministries. You know, they have these expectations of like, the senior pastor they came from, or the church they came from, or the ministry they came from, or what they were and being something else at one time. But they haven't found out what they are today. Who are they today? What are they really? Are they, you know, the sum total of their parts? Meaning like, okay, you know, they're into football, or they're into baseball, or they're into sports, or they're into, you know, extreme car driving, you know. And they're able to relate, you know, on these all the different levels so that you can be one of the men, the people, you know, so that you can be also the man of God. And it's like, well, yeah, okay, fine. I'm not. I never have been. I'm odd. I'm weird. I'm different. I'm, I'm a Jew. You know, what can I say? Maybe you are too. But, you know, no, Jewish people, you know, I mean, there's still other people, you know, but there's also a difference in some ways, you know. We're kind of like, hmm. A Jew gets saved is like really interested in some different things. You know, I'll admit that. I want out of here, <laughs> quite frankly. I want to go home. I want to be with Jesus. I want to see him face to face. I don't want to ask him any questions. I just want to love on him. I just want to be the oneness of God. I want to be in that echad, the unity with the Father and the Son and the Spirit that we become... Oh, yeah, you know, get it? Got it? Good. Because that's what it is. That's what eternity is. Jesus said, eternal life is this, that they should know you and know him who you have sent. That's what eternal life is. We're not meant for this life. This is not the world we're meant to be in. This is not the creation that God intended for man to be a part of. This is a land under a curse. This is a people under a curse. This is a world under a curse. And people are trying to save it? Jews call it repairing the world. It's a false teaching. It's a false idea. It's not true. The repairing of the world is the whole concept of trying the millennium. What are they going to be doing in the millennium? Repairing the world. <laughs> go out, work, fine. I'm going to go relax, take it easy, kick back. You know. Maybe make some other person. <laughs> I'm not being a king or a priest, I'm sorry. Make some other person go work on the world, you know, clean up the act that man made, take everything down, you know, that was built up. Of course, I think the tribulation will take care of most of that. But my point is this. If your perspective isn't looking at the eternity of your life, if you're not looking beyond your day-to-day -day existence, and you're not saying today is eternity, that there's an eternal reality that's happening right around me with demons on one side, angels on the other, principalities above me, powers below me, and all these things of spiritual wickedness and spiritual righteousness being accomplished right now, right there, where you are. 
man, you're deaf, dumb, and blind. You're sheep ready for the slaughter. You don't get it. You don't understand why they said to put on spiritual armor. You don't know who you really are, do you? You're a son of God. Jesus died for you. You are a precious possession that God is doing warfare on your behalf until you get your act together. And he wants you to grow up into the stature of the men of God. The man of God, the woman of God, the child of God that you're meant to be. In reality, you don't need to do much except call upon the name of the Lord to say, God, what's up? What's going on? Uh, there's spiritual things happening. I need you to take care of them. I can't see them. I need you to operate as the sword of the Lord because that's who you are. As the captain of the king's host, the captain of the king's army. God, you take care of it. God, you do it. Jesus always referred back to God doing, not him doing. You know, he finds to get the behind Satan. But, you know, I mean, the point being is pretty simple. His dependency and his relationship was interdependence upon God doing for him, even though he could have done of himself. He did not, and he chose to be obedient by allowing the sufferings of the things that he went through to be subservient to his Father in heaven. And that's what we're meant to do. We don't have to stress it. We just have to bless it. We don't have to worry and be anxious. We just have to have love and peace. We just have to experience the joy of the Lord in seeing the sunrise, to seeing the wind blow, to seeing that the storms of life, because we built our foundation upon these sayings of mine, as Jesus said in Matthew, of what he taught in the blesseds, you know the part, love your enemies, love your neighbors yourself. Yeah, you know, don't go out shooting people and killing them. You got more to do than that. You got to live with them. Try that to emphasize. It's easy to pull the trigger. It's a whole different matter to disciple someone that you hate. It's a whole harder thing to live the long term, like Steve Mays had to, the long term reality of somebody rejecting you until the day that God fulfills his promise to you and brings back your own daughter that you could love. Yeah. Calvary Chapel Pastor. Hate. Mm -hmm. Because we all have issues inside that God is changing and rearranging daily to prepare us for the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said it this way, preach saying, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight his paths, for behold, the king cometh. He rideth in with ten thousands of his saints. Well, that's going to happen, but it's going to be a little while down the road. But in the meantime, there's a promise for you and I that's very interesting. Behold, I stand at the door and knock is part of it, but a more blessed part is today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Stop what you're doing. I don't care if you got to go to work. I don't care if you got a screaming kid or a screaming wife or you got a, a boring husband or a faithless servant or God knows what. The army's knocking at the door or someone else is coming you know, and calling you or texting you or you're driving in your car. I don't give, quite frankly, one iota of care except for one thing you do. Hear his voice. Walk in his will. Do his way. Because if you don't, you won't make it. The world is getting dark and evil is coming. Jesus said, My servants work while it is day, but the night is coming when no man may work. The night has fallen, and the day is at hand. Behold, the sun begins to rise, but the clouds and the storms have come. Where are you at today? Have you chosen to serve the Lord your God with all your heart? You know, all your heart, not just part of it on certain days. Have you chosen to serve Jesus with all your soul, with all that emotional baggage and luggage, all those emotions that you know are hate, our anxiousness, our fears, but also the love, the peace, and the joy? Are you choosing to give Jesus that? Because he died for you, for those emotions. With all your mind and with all your strength, are you willing to depend upon the Spirit of God to lead you, to guide you, to abide with you, 
to lead you in the way that you should go. That you would hear a voice saying in your ear, turn to the left or turn to the right. Be still. Wait. Go forward. Stand still. Trust in me. Do this. Don't do this. Yes. No. In reality. In perspective. If we put the rubber where the road is, if we put it right down to the brass tacks, how real is your God? <laughs> how real indeed? Because every day, every day, I'm walking with my God and I'm getting more intimate every way I know how. And every chance and opportunity I get, I'm talking to God about it. Because if I don't like the program, I'm going to change it. Because I'm going to pray. And you know what? God does move according to the prayers of His people. And we cry out to God and we're saved. We cry out to God and we're delivered. We cry out to God and He becomes our strength. Would you cry out to God. If you're not saved, they, they, they cry out to God and be saved. He'll do it. It's that simple. Just cry out. Just say, God, save me. I don't care about the sinner's prayer. I don't care about you know you knowing this, knowing that. You've heard it all before. If you're not saved, cry out. If you've been blowing it, hey, you know, it's not easy to give it up. Now, I'll admit, sin is fun. Sin got you in its links or whatever, tearing at you, pulling you by the jaw. <laughs> You know, dragging it along, got hooks in your nose, you know. You pierced it, now they're pulling it. I get you, I got you. You're going to get it, you know, you'll find out. But the point is this cry out. God didn't say He would leave you, He said He would be with you. And that if you do miss the rapture for whatever reason, He'll be with you. It's going to kill you. It will. Guaranteed, you'll die. But He'll be with you. And you will move into that place of eternity with Him. But God forbid that you should choose to live your life in such a way that you can't hear His voice. And that today, if He does speak and say, Come up hither, you don't hear the call. And you wind up staying here. And you find out that's all there is. Oh my God. No reason for anyone to not be saved. There's no reason for anyone to go to hell. There really isn't. God has done everything He will do. What can we do now to spare anyone and everyone that eternal destiny of suffering with beings that we were never meant to be a part of? The rationale of Satan and all his demonic fallen angels being eternally banished from perfection and why would we want to live an imperfect life and become imperfect in eternity forever? Suffering the impurities of our own choice in the reality of the absence of God, which is like a burning fire, which is the lake of fire. The lake of fire is very simple to explain. It's just simply the absence of God. Because everything that we are has God's imprint on it. And when you take yourself outside of the presence of God, literally, when you get that far out, where there is absolute darkness and weeping and gnashing of teeth, where it is the absolute absence of God, which only God can do, we can't do it, we can't even imagine it. When you actually get into that kind of dimension, then your senses, your being, your emotional soul cries out in agony because it has to have input and it has nothing from God and creation. What you were created to be was to be an input and export device, so to speak, of a living being, a representation of God Himself. And being imperfect, if you choose to be in hell as that imperfect creation that God has to separate from the perfection and cast out into outer darkness, which is the lake of fire, then you will burn for eternity because of the absence of the presence of love. Because that's what it is. God is love. And it's not just God is love in some way of not being God himself. No, God is love. And love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth God. God is love. But the point is this. 
the absence of that input of love and being loved will torment you for eternity. And it will be a lake of fire for you. And that's not something any man should ever endure. Woman, child, or being. No matter what they are or who they are. God forbid that hell should come and knock on our door and we run to the call. God forbid that Armageddon be calling us to the war and we choose to go to the very last war and perish. God forbid that we hear any other voice speaking to us, whether our pastor, whether our teacher, whether our elder, whether our deacon, whether our minister, whether our government, whether our family member, whether our spouse, whether our children, whether any other person, even our own selves, tell us any other voice to listen to except the voice of God speaking to us in the form of Jesus himself by way of his spirit reminding us of the things he said then we're deceived God help us to keep the right perspective we need perspective today choose you this day whom you will serve whether it be the Lord your God or whether it be the gods of men the perspective is yours to make the voice you hear will be the one you serve.